But now it's time to welcome Steve Forbes. We are absolutely thrilled to welcome back one of our favorite guests, Mr. Steve Forbes. Steve is editor-in-chief of Forbes Media and one of the nation's leading authorities on business, the economy, financial markets, and in my opinion, lots of stuff. He is also the author of Reviving America, How Repealing Obamacare, Replacing the Tax Code, and Reforming the Fed Will Restore Hope and Prosperity. Steve, welcome back to the show. Good to be with you again, David. Thank you. So I was, we were here in December, and I was really doubting whether or not we could see 4% GDP. I was thinking maybe 3 was more realistic with the tax cuts. And you said, no, no, we'll get to 4%. But did even you think that it would have happened this quickly in the second quarter of 2018? Uh, the answer actually is yes. I'm surprised we didn't see more of a bump in the first quarter uh, because people began to anticipate late last year that this was going to come to pass, not combined with deregulation. Uh, what Keynes called the animal spirits were starting to revive again. So uh, when the tax cut actually came in, the president signed it. Businesses could uh, start to invest more again. Uh, consumers could look forward to a tax cut, mm -hmm. not as big as I would have liked, but hey, better than uh, what they'd been getting for the last uh, decade or so. So yeah, yeah, 4% after 10 years of under 2%, that's just the beginning. Just, Should be just the beginning. Just the beginning, I, I, I hope you're right. I mean, that's great. So you mentioned the two places here where we could have gotten a, an economic bump. One, of course, is consumers, and the other, of course, is the tax cut for businesses and corporations. My question for you is actually, if you had to guess, which of those two do you think has been the primary driver getting us from two, two to 4% GDP growth this quickly? Uh, I think the business side, not just okay. because it helps business, but also it helped smaller businesses. And I think consumers felt that now they saw uh, companies starting to invest again, starting to hire more again, they felt it's a safe to start spending again. You know, you may have uh, money, you may have it saved away, but if you are uncertain about the future, you're gonna clutch your cash. The cash has been uh, unleashed. You keep seeing it in the retail sales. People feel there's a future again, and you're not going to uh, rue the day that you went out and bought a new car. <laughs> right, right. And, and well, business owner sentiment, of course, is now at a record high, just very recent report in the last couple of weeks, which is, which is wonderful news. Uh, so you know, the, the, the question then becomes, how about those reports when it comes to businesses and corporations? Those reports that say that corporate America seems to be taking a lot of their money and using it to just increase stock repurchases for their own company's stock. Have you seen those reports? And if so, what do you think about it? Do you think those are just the naysayers or do you think there's something to that? Well, what's wrong with a company buying in its own stock? If they don't feel they can put the money productively to work, get it out to people who will put it productively to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember back in the 60s and 70s when we had sky-high corporate tax rates, sky-high personal tax rates, companies kept their cash and they bought stuff and got into stuff they had no business getting into. So if we want a good, efficient capital market where the money's being used the best way possible, yeah, if you can't use it, let somebody else use it. Sure, sure. And I get that, and that's great business practice. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't, it's, it's not buying more capital equipment, it's not hiring more employees. So I guess the only fear that they have, some of the people who've published some of these articles, is simply that if that should continue, and if that's where most of the money's going, then it's not really going to stimulate the economy. But well, what happens when a shareholder uh, gets the cash? Are they going to put it under their mattress? No. They're going to put it out to work. They may buy something, may invest in something, or put it with an institution that will invest it. So the money doesn't stay still. And mm -hmm. This idea that if uh, you uh, hand it out to shareholders, it somehow disappears in the stratosphere, absolutely wrong. So uh, again, if you can't put it to productive use, put it in the hands of people who will put it to productive use. So it's the old velocity of money concept that money is being used many, many times over. So dividends, yes, go in the hand of shareholders, but even capital appreciation. You know, your, your average viewer here of the income generation who sees their portfolio go up in value, who feels a little more confident, who might go out and spend. So it really kind of sort of is the ultimate of the trickle-down theory in a way, correct? It's really the trickle-up theory. Yeah. Growth comes from people doing things. Investing, you don't have investing, you don't get a higher standard of living. So you get more investing, 
you get more hiring, you get more productivity. So even if a certain industry or company has to shrink because of changes or whatever, you got more than enough coming in to uh, not only take up the slack, but imagine now, some industries are having serious labor shortages. When I know. was the last time we had that? I know, a long time. So it brings me to a question then in maybe the 20 seconds we have left in the segment, wage growth. The last domino that has to really fall is wage growth, and we haven't really seen that yet. What, what's going to make that happen eventually? Uh, the idea that this economy is going to continue to grow. So if the clouds that are out there start to dissipate even more, you're going to see wage growth because companies are not going to be fearful of bidding for labor because they know this is going to last. They're not going to feel six months from now, oh my God, I hired too much, I have to lay off now. Remember, there are still a lot of remaining fears from what happened a decade ago. So it goes back to confidence. It all comes down to confidence and, and animal spirits. Uh, we have you here for a little while today, so uh, you stay with us also. We'll be back in a moment. We need to take a commercial break. We'll be right back on the income generation. More with Steve Forbes to come. But now it's time to welcome back our good friend, Steve Forbes. So, so okay, so it makes sense that the animal spirits will, will ultimately fuel some of these things that you're talking about, business owner confidence and even consumer confidence. But then the question becomes, is it sustainable? You know, uh, when you get a tax cut, tax cuts, of course, are a one-time thing, and that pushes up the GDP, gets you a big growth bump. But then if you don't get a tax cut every year, then how does that, that, that growth continue to sustain itself from a one-time event such as a tax cut? Or can it, in your opinion? Well, this is where the tax bill actually had got it right was but when you reduce rates, that is reducing the price of investing, <clears throat> reducing the price of doing productive things. So it's not just a one time uh, getting, keeping more of what you earn, but it also sets the stage to invest where you earn more in the future. So it's a twofer, an immediate impact in the pocketbook, positive, but also lowering the price of doing good things in the future, you get more of those good things. So I think that in that sense it's sustainable, and if you combine it with doing more, which I think uh, the Republicans should be uh, out there outlining in a very specific way how they can do more, then by golly, again, you got a golden circle here, virtuous now, circle. And it seems to me what you said is correct, that doing more is, is going to be ultimately a huge part of this, because you always do get after a tax cut a bump, and then things will pull back a little bit because people get used to that tax cut. Um, so this is a great jump start that we never really had during the last administration, um, but it's a jump start now. And as long as they do a little bit more to keep it sustained, we, we should be in good shape. Um, well, I, hope they, I hope they don't do it uh, a little step by steps. I hope they go for the grand slam. The bases are loaded, no outs, uh, no strikes on you. Go for it. And uh, that's why the Republicans, they talk about Tax Cut 2.0, the President's made reference to it. Well, the GOP should be putting out specific proposals, reducing personal tax rates, reducing the capital gains tax, which is, again, sure. a twofer. You get immediate income from it for, in terms of government revenue, if you're worried about that kind of thing, but also helps uh, stimulate the economy. So, so let's talk about that, because when you were here literally just a few days after the new tax law was passed in December, you told me that you thought that we would have a, a 2.0 version. And now, all of a sudden, lo and behold, they're talking about a 2.0 version. So what do you really think is going to be in their tax plan, and will they be able to get it through? I know you'd love to see the capital gains cuts. We talked about that last time. Will they be able to do that? And if not, what will they be able to do and successfully get through Congress? Well, to be able to do it, they've got to win the elections in November, keep the House, expand their lead in the Senate. And that means putting out to the American people, here's what's going to happen. Here's your next Christmas present. You got one when the president signed it late last year, just before Christmas. Here's Christmas present number two, if we win these elections. So if they win the elections, they'll do up uh, what you might call uh, cleaning up chores, like making the tax cuts permanent, stuff like that. But the real thing they have to do is reduce the personal tax rates so people get more and takes away that issue from the Democrats. Uh, more than ever before, reduce the capital gains, and how about reducing the, uh, the 
payroll tax, what they call FICA, mm -hmm. Social sure. Security. Suspend that a uh, couple of points. So you're saying be, by being visible, doing what the Federal Reserve has done recently, and basically coming out and saying, "Look, this is what we're doing. This is our plan," might just help the Republicans stay in office in November. But how about the other side of the coin? How about as we see this wealth effect that we talked about earlier come through, where the stock market maybe takes another bump because corporations are buying back their stock, and now all of a sudden the liberals come in, they say, "Well, what the heck is going on here? You know, there's a bigger and bigger disparity between the classes." That's not good. It's kind of a tightrope they have to walk is, between now and election time. Isn't it kind of sort of true? Uh, well, I think uh, when people are beginning to feel, which is one reason why you'd never know it from the media, uh, the temperature of the country is going down a tad. And not on the extremes, but uh, people are saying, by golly, this might be for real. Mm -hmm. And when things are going well for you, it's harder to get mad and stay mad. So. So things are going well, so you think that as long as they can maintain some momentum, things will look good in November. The American people are not envious. They don't care if Bill Gates is going to make another $10 billion or Bezos is going to make another $50 billion. If their prospects are improving, they can see they're going to earn more, they're going to get a better job, they're happy. They want their fair share, and that's they're, it. Their pursuit that, of happiness, that makes absolutely. Sense. And I'd like, I'd, like to, I'd like to think of all Americans that way, and I'd like to think of, especially our income generation viewers, as being very fair-minded and trying to do the greater good. So speaking of that, you stay with us. We'll be right back with many more words of wisdom from our good friend, Steve Forbes. Stay with us. We'll be right back. But now it's time to welcome back to our show Steve Forbes talking about taxes, and now talking about actually the 2.0 version of the Republicans' tax plan moving forward. So you think that they might have a shot at getting capital gains reduction. What else do you think they might have a shot at getting through in this next iteration? Uh, what they have to do is ignore the Congressional Budget Office and these self-imposed <laughs> restraints. You know, the CBO, as they call it, Congressional Budget Office, pretends it can predict the future. If it could, they wouldn't be working at the CBO. Uh, they'd be out buying lottery tickets, uh, having the right numbers. But, uh, but, uh, but so what they should do is also propose cuts in income tax rates. For example, there's still a lot of confusion on pass-through corporations. Yeah, uh, whether are. it's personal, uh, they just made it hopelessly complicated. You take 10 points off the ta top tax rate, and boom, that goes away. Cut other tax rates, like Reagan did. And uh, that way, even though the CBO will howl, the Democrats will howl, the American people will applaud because they say, by golly, not only am I keeping more now, but I'm going to even more earn even more in the future. Hooray. OK, so speaking of the CBO, uh, some of the, the naysayers now are talking about that. They're saying, gosh, the deficit is growing. Um, how long can we continue with tax cuts when we're running a deficit? We need to have a budget. We need to stick to a budget. Um, and I know last time you were here, you said that, well, if we can get to 4%, we can grow our way out of it. We can ultimately bring more tax revenue in with lower rates. We're at 4% now. So I guess the question becomes, how long realistically will it take then for us to start seeing that, for us to see those higher tax revenues so that the naysayers will stop and, and, and realize that maybe we can grow our way out of it? Well, what's amazing is revenues have held up where they were last year despite this massive tax cut. So it shows that when you have more economic activity, which is people being able to do more, more things productively, uh, the government benefits too. I'm not a big government guy, but if you want to grow government revenue, you have a vibrant economy. And so in terms of the future, what you want is more of a vibrant economy, growing 4 or 5%. And remember, investments don't happen overnight. If you put in a new factory, new facility, it may take a year, two years, three years before it comes online. Sure. So you don't just turn it like a light switch. So, uh, but again, people feel that things are happening, and in terms of the deficit, the problem is not government revenues. It's always been government spending. Yes. That's the problem. And yes. so to punish the American people because Washington can't say no to anything uh, it, 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 it is backwards. Uh, the American people should not be punished because Washington can't get its act together. I agree with, I absolutely agree with that. Spending is something that with bipartisan Congress is so difficult to get through. But I, I, I don't know if you realize something, but you said something slipped out just a couple minutes ago. You know, we were talking about whether it's going to be 3 or 4% GDP growth. And just a moment ago, you, you whipped out the five handle. You said, well, 4 or 5. 
So do you think we could heat it up even a little more and get closer to five? I mean, even President Trump didn't make that claim. Uh, yeah, and they always accuse him of being the wild man. That's right. But, uh, but uh, in terms of if the uncertainties created by these trade uh, disputes, and there's not a trade war yet, they're trade skirmishes, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. if, if they suddenly magically disappeared in the next few months, by golly, you would see four to five percent. Remember, this economy over time, this country grows uh, three, three and a half percent on average, which means you have some good years and bad years. We've had a decade of about one and a half, one and three quarters percent growth. Four or five percent for several years is not a stretch given what we've been through. Well, I'm glad to hear you talk about the trade deficit. We don't have enough time in this block, I, but, but can you stick around for one more brief block for sure. us? Because I'd like to talk to you about the trade deficit too. And to see whether or not you know we can actually win a trade war, uh, and if so, what it would take, even if other countries like China don't necessarily capitulate. So stay with us. We'll be back, and you stay with us too. We have many more words of wisdom in our last segment here from our good friend Steve Forbes. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Income Generation. And we are back here on the Income Generation with our good friend Steve Forbes, who is gracious enough to stay with us for one more block to talk about the trade war. If China doesn't cooperate, if other countries don't ultimately cooperate and go to a more fair tariff plan, if you will, can we win an all-out trade war as a country? The problem with uh, tariffs, it's, which are, uh, tariff is another word for sales tax, is we are putting a sales tax on American people, American businesses. And uh, I think with the Europeans, I think uh, with Mexico, perhaps even Canada, we can come in agreement. The real tough one, as you mentioned, is going to be China. And there, I think we have to take a more laser-like approach. Cooperate with our European allies who also know China's engaging in stuff that hurts them, and go after specific industries, specific companies and do it publicly or if you want to do it privately, but if China knows that something bad's going to happen and you've got the world behind us and not them, I think you're going to see more results more quickly. But if the whole world thinks, look, we may have a trade uh, war, we're not there yet a trade war, then again, that holds things back and it's going to be harder to get quick results. Well, a trade war can kill those animal spirits that you were talking about just a <coughs> moment ago. I get that. But the question becomes, Gosh, if, if, if we were really net importers, you know, we have a trade deficit, then the reality of it is, don't we have a slight advantage over other countries in a trade war because in some ways they have more to lose than us? Uh, they may be hurt, but we're hurt. And remember, uh, we're talking about merchandise trade. You've got to put in services. You've got to put in investments. Uh, a lot of you know, Germans and others invest money in this country building manufacturing plants, automotive plants, chemical plants, and the like. And so that's going to dry up. And given what we're doing on taxes, I think you're going to see more foreign capital, if, they, if things calm down, coming in because we're going to be a better place to put their uh, investment money than the rest of the world. We're, yeah. uh, you know, as the president once said, we're going to be winning so much, we're going to be saying, stop. <laughs> but if we get these trade uncertainties out of the way, we're going to have uh, the problem of, geez, there's too much money coming into this country. That's a great problem <laughs> to have. Yeah. So do me a favor, 20 seconds or less, tell our income generation viewers, please, what you think, your personal opinion, that they should be doing financially and shouldn't be doing right now. Uh, don't panic. Don't try to market time. And uh, on uh, income generation, one of the things is I wouldn't go with a 10 or 30 year treasury unless you're nimble enough to be able to do the ups and downs and the prices of those securities. Because if you get as much as for two years as you can for 10 or 30, I would go with the two. <laughs> keep, it, keep, it, keep it short enough, keep it yeah. short enough, which is, always, which is always good advice. Stephen, thanks so much for being here. Thank really you, appreciate David. you today uh, once again. And you stay with us. Uh, we'll be right back again for more on our show here on the Income Generation.